All right, guys. Hi, hello. Uh, welcome to our next uh, uh, learning objective, really, for our unit three. Uh, by this point, we have talked about all of the things that geographically impacted the people of India, uh, or you should have by this point in having our first of our notes. Uh, now we're moving on to those people and who is it that settled in the subcontinent of India and what kinds of characteristics that they have. Uh, each of the four civilizations we'll talk about, two today and two tomorrow, uh, have, a, again, important roles to play in the development of the very diverse Indian culture that exists in this day and age. Uh, so we're just going to kind of dive right in. You guys should grab out your notebooks and uh, keep filling in all of the information as we go. Uh, we're going to talk first about the uh, Harappans, and then we'll talk about the Aryans. At the end of our lecture today, I'll go through the work to be completed, uh, which of course is very important to keeping track of everything, uh, again, as far as moving forward in this unit. Okay, so starting things off, we've got our very first civilization to develop in India, which is the Harappans. Uh, the Harappans are going to be an interesting group, uh, again, that develop in the Indus River Valley, so kind of hearkening back to our stuff from earlier in the week, uh, they're going to establish two major cities. Again, there's Harappa, which we've seen in the past is pretty typical for early civilizations to name their cities after themselves. Uh, and then there's Mohenjo-Daro. Uh, these are two cities which we have evidence of today what they looked like. They were large cities with walled off neighborhoods uh, and they had row houses made out of mud bricks. Uh, and there was almost always a courtyard in the middle. Uh, again, distinctive cultural elements that uh, this early civilization developed over time. Another interesting thing about these ancient cities is that they were, I guess, in a lot of ways more advanced than some of the other groups that we've talked about so far. And we found evidence that there was a advanced drainage system so that, again, all of the excess water and not so niceness, uh, could, would drain away from the city itself. So it wasn't quite as maybe filthy as some of the other cities we've talked about in the past. Uh, also, we found ancient trash chutes to try and keep the cities clean. Uh, they would create spaces to be able to put that trash in their waste that they created, which is not common in most ancient cities we've discussed. Uh, this uh, group, of course, besides establishing cities, another characteristic that civilizations always figure out eventually is going to be government. Uh, who's in charge and how is it that they get that power and keep that power? The early government of the Harappan people uh, is going to have, they're going to have rulers like we've seen uh, so far, and their power is based on the belief in divine assistance. Uh, again, it's not the same as the Egyptians. It's much closer to our, uh, again, Islamic uh, civilizations we talked about. Again, theocratic in a lot of ways because politics and religions are they're, it's going to be closely linked. Uh, whoever's in charge, whatever religion they practice, is going to be the religion of the people, at least for the most part. Uh, the royal temple uh, and the palace are all going to be located in the citadel or the fortress. Uh, we saw this with our in Middle Eastern city-states, uh, as well as a lot of the early days, again, seeing that connection overall. Uh, the type of economy that the Harappan people had, not a shocking one. Uh, again, farming based is going to be the start of all civilizations in this uh, discussion, in these discussions we have. Uh, the types of uh, food that they're going to systematically grow are going to be wheat and barley and peas. Uh, this is all happening in the really infertile Indus River Valley, where we've seen river valleys in both the Middle East uh, and in, uh, like in Africa, uh, all of the places, they all seem to start in these same similar kind of geographic regions. They will also have a pretty, again, it just comes down to lucrative trade system. Uh, again, the types of goods and resources that they're going to trade are some new things that we haven't really seen, I guess, yet. Uh, copper, lumber, precious stones, cotton, uh, other various luxury goods also. The Harappan people are the first, and that's probably the most significant thing about them. They're going to set things up, set a tone for a lot of the groups that come after them. Uh, how they fall apart, 
it's a little bit unknown. I uh, again could have been natural causes through a disaster like a flood or an earthquake. Uh, I could be changed in the climate, which has had an impact on groups in the past. Uh, I could be a change of course in the river. A lot of people think that it probably has to do with foreign migration, other groups coming into the area and challenging them, uh, changing the priorities and the values of the group, so on and so forth. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the Harappan people. The next group we're going to talk about is the Aryans. Uh, the Aryans are a group of nomadic people, similar to a lot of groups that we've talked about at this point, again, a point to the original Arabs were nomadic, uh, or Berbers were nomadic, so on and so forth. Uh, but this group is uh, speaking a different language. Uh, again, it's Indo-European based, and uh, these people are going to come from up northern India, uh, again, coming into northern India, again, skirting around the Himalayas and making their way in here uh, from Central Asia. Uh, they're pretty, I guess, traditional in a lot of ways. They were little tribal groups that were moving into the space, uh, again, with strong, a strong warrior tradition, meaning that they had a lot of skill when it came to combat. Uh, and they slowly but surely moved across the subcontinent until they controlled pretty much all of the people that were there. Uh, when the Aryans first arrived on the scene in India, they didn't have a written language, uh, but that doesn't mean they don't figure one out because uh, one of the biggest reasons that the Aryan people are important is because of this change uh, that they create. One is by creating a written language. It's called Sanskrit, and it's very likely you've seen it before. There's an example on this slide uh, where you can see uh, just some, again, very early writing here. It's one of the earliest uh, writing systems that is out there, like the Sumerians with cuneiform and, of course, our Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, the, what we see in the Sanskrit writings of the Aryan people are a lot of legends and chants, rituals. We're going to see here that the Aryans uh, are going to be responsible for taking down a lot of really important cultural development in this late or this early time period. Uh, and the records also showcase during this time that they are going to take the territory of India and divide it into smaller kingdoms, uh, which are ruled by rajas or princes. Raja might sound sort of familiar because uh, Raja is the name of the tiger in Aladdin, and I always think about that. That. I don't know why, uh, but Raja means prince uh, in this language that they're speaking here. And uh, again, each of those kingdoms are going to start to develop their own way of life. Uh, when it comes to the daily life of the Aryan people, a lot of their customs and traditions are going to outlive them. Uh, they're going to become very much a part of all of the Indian groups that we're going to discuss, and that's another why are they so important to India at this time. Uh, one, of course, is uh, the importance of uh, their, again, family. Uh, underneath the Aryan group, we're going to see that they are going to have the entire extended family. They all live together. So thinking, again, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpa, uh, all of that. Uh, it's a very male-dominated society. Not a surprising statement. It's something that will again continue through here. Uh, something that's a, an interesting thing about the Aryan people is that they uh, definitely believe in arranged marriages, which isn't a again a totally unique idea at this ancient time period. But it's something that lasts in Indian culture a lot longer than it does in others. Uh, the idea of a dowry. A dowry is pretty much like. Uh, again, an arranged marriage is like a business deal, uh, and a dowry would be like a signing bonus. So if a man agrees to marry a daughter of, of some family, that family would be expected to give a gift uh, to sort of sweeten the deal, which of course today sounds a little bit suspect, but back then it was commonplace. Um, uh, to kind of further impact, again, to, I guess, impress upon you how... I guess, significant, uh, the male dominance was in uh, Aryan society is this idea of a suti. A suti is something that existed for a lot longer than I would assume other things do. Um, but uh, this is where a wife would throw themselves onto their husband after death. Again, in Aryan society, the tradition is to burn the body. Uh, and of course, that means that these women would be 
putting themselves to death because living in a in their in the world without their husband was not a good alternative. Uh, so it's something that's pretty extreme, but it is important to understand about the Aryan people. The next piece here is going to be talking about this development of religion. And we're going to spend next week talking about the specifics of the religions that develop in this time period, this ancient time period with our different civilizations. Excuse me. Is um, a religion that's based off of a complex set of rituals called the Vedas. Uh, again, it's something that the Aryan people put together, but other groups are going to adopt as well. And it revolves around social classes or social groups. They're called Varnas. Um, the Varnas, and I'm going to apologize for my butchering of the language, but this is what we got. Um, the different groups, and this is in numeric, again, I guess, uh, importance. We've got Brahmins at the top, uh, and then you've got your Kesha. Triyas, uh, Vaishyas, and then of course Sundras. Uh, These uh, groups are all going to be part of something that is hugely important and you should put a big star next to it, uh, and that is the development of the caste system. This is a both a religious as well as a social understanding. Uh, it's something that becomes the, they are connected so closely that it's pretty hard to separate them, uh, but the caste system basically explains exactly where every person born into Indian society, where they fit. Uh, so when you are born, you are born directly into a caste, a social group. Uh, and that social group has a certain expectations, what kinds of jobs you can have, who you can marry, who you can be friends with. Uh, a big thing that ties this to the religion of India is going to be the connection between uh, past lives. The people of India believe in reincarnation and uh, what caste you are born into reflects who you were like as a person before in your past life. So if you're a bad person, you'd be reborn into a low Varnas after reincarnation. Uh, if you're a good person, you'd go up higher. Uh, this, of course, is something that it's a huge part of Indian experience, and it is going to outlast the Aryan people even when the Aryans are gone. Uh, this right here is a breakdown of the caste system, which you should draw into your notebooks. If you have to stop me at any point to do this, do that, please, because this is very important. It's a key term, and it's an important visual to have. Uh, so our caste system, which is both a social and a religious breakdown, is going to showcase our different groups. Uh, there are four in the pyramid proper, I suppose. And then there is a group down at the bottom, which we'll talk about briefly. So in the first or the top section of our caste system are the Brahmins. Uh, these are going to be the religious leaders. Uh, they're going to be considered pure. Uh, but again, the color that is associated with them is the color white, which of course is a pure color. Uh, may, like I said, this is a lot to do with religion and belief. And if you are going to be born into the Brahmin level of the caste system, you're going to be considered having led a very good life in your previous life. Uh, the next is going to be the, uh, again, Kshatriyas, which is looking at the warrior class. Uh, the rulers fit into this one too. The color that they're associated with is color red. Uh, again, this is a, a going to be another very well looked after class. They are allowed of privileges in these first two classes of the caste system. Things they can do, the freedoms that they have are a lot more. Uh, then you've got to the, again, Bish Bishras, which are going to be our commoners, merchants, farmers, the color they're associated with the color brown. I always think brown because it's, uh, again, the idea of like working with the earth. Uh, they're going to, again, have a limited access to wealth and prosperity, but they're still respected, uh, again, as far as a caste goes. Then there's the Sundras at the bottom. We've got ourselves peasants, servants, the lowest of the low, the, well, not the lowest of the low, the lowest in this traditional caste system. Uh, they have limited rights. Religiously, they're considered impure. The color they're associated with is 
the color black. Uh, and that, again, each of these different castes, they have different amounts of freedoms and choice. Obviously, wealth comes into play here, too. If you're a priest, you're much more comfortable and wealthy as opposed to a peasant or a servant. Uh, the group uh, within the caste that I hadn't mentioned and one that you're going to have to add and make sure that you keep in mind here is the group that is the lowest of the low. Uh, they're referred to as untouchables. Again, these are the people who are going to be absolutely destitute in a lot of situations. The only kinds of jobs that they can have are going to be degrading uh, or looked down as being the worst possible jobs. I'm not saying in today's day and age that's the truth, but in Indian, ancient Indian culture, they were. Uh, trash collection, handling dead bodies, and if you didn't have a job, this is where you would fit, all that kind of jazz. That's it for notes. When you're finished with that, you can put your notebooks away. Uh, pause me and get this into your notebooks if you, I'm going too fast for you at this moment in time, okay? All that's left to talk about is going to be work to be completed. Uh, there'll be another PowerPoint tomorrow with a little bit of a video to watch and some notes to take with two other groups. Uh, again, there'll be some reminders and all that good stuff. You do have a new homework assignment for the new learning objective, which is it going to be collected by the end of the school day on Friday. So you have three days to complete. So you can get started today. Uh, again, keep working tomorrow and finish it on Friday. That's the goal here. Uh, full directions are on Classroom, but you're going to be using the textbook and using your notes you're getting here to fill in a spec table for each of these civilizations. Uh, I've given you a good amount of information, but there's always more to be found, so feel free to utilize the textbook. There's two different ways to access it. Uh, if you have trouble, let me know as soon as possible. Uh, this will get submitted to turnitin.com, just like our map activity from earlier in the week. Uh, the other thing I'm going to remind you every time I get one of these lectures out there is that you should be starting your study aid. Uh, by the end of this lecture right here, we'll have covered five of the total of all of the different key terms. So again, start chipping it away at it as soon as possible. Uh, again, you'll be submitting that to me on the 24th, which will be the last day of unit for you guys. Uh, that's all I got. I hope you have a good 